It was three years ago, I remember it extremely well, when um, EVE Online had just introduced uh, IAPs, and there was a real shitstorm. Um, and Hilmar actually came to Game Horizon at the climax of that and gave a wonderfully insightful but also a terrifyingly candidate talk about the mistakes they've made. So we very much look forward to hearing the sequel. Okay. Uh, well, it's good to be back here. Um, and uh, I mean, I will carry the thread a little bit forward on what has been going on at CCP since uh, 2011, where we were going through some turbulent times. Just for those that don't know, uh, here's sort of brief stats uh, about CCP. So uh, we have about uh, 400 people worldwide. We're located in Reykjavik, Shanghai, San Francisco, Atlanta, and here in Newcastle. Uh, Newcastle is actually home of Eve Valkyrie, which uh, is a new game we've been working on for VR headsets, and we have some of the team members here in the front row. They're, let's give them a little applause. Um, and uh, Eve Valkyrie is actually a, a game that uh, has gone through a, sort of an interesting organic process throughout the company and uh, resonated a lot what AJ was talking about. Uh, it's kind of a, a, a game that came out of a grassroots initiative and really took off like a rocket and we've been sort of finding ways to make sure that our normal ways of doing games are not in the way of, of continuing that blast off. Anyway, back to Iceland, where I come from, known for unpronounceable volcanoes that stop airports. Uh, also a bit famous for economical experiments, um, uh, where we have a, a country of 300,000 people that have their own currency, which they can print uh, themselves, called ISK, the same name as we have in EVE. Anyway, this whole thing, this uh, experiment that is Iceland, has inspired us to uh, take a different stance to creating uh, virtual worlds. Uh, we very much model them after uh, the real world. Uh, there's a lot of thinking on economy and trading and democracy and, and social equality and things like that that goes into it, which we have been inspired by sitting in this little sort of experimental kitchen of economy. Uh, out of that has come uh, EVE Online, which um, is the largest massively multiplayer science fiction franchise which is a very precise term, to be the biggest in something. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm going to play a little sort of sizzle reel from last week. Last week we had 2,000 people come for a party uh, in Iceland around the EVE universe called the FanFest. And I'm going to roll that now a little bit.
Yeah, very sisly, wasn't it? Uh, so, um, we very much uh, think of what we do as building a universe, where, as you saw, we have sort of different uh, sort of specialized product experiences uh, that plug into the overall universe, so that you can go and play Dust, you can go and play Eve, you can blow, go and play Valkyrie, and somehow you belong to the sort of same social networks, the same social economy. And we've done some experiments on, on, on doing this, how we have linked Dust and Eve together, figuring out what's the right path for Valkyrie into that. And ultimately, uh, we want to turn this into a virtual world that will be more meaningful than real life. And uh, this is a crazy, audacious statement we wrote down uh, in 2008. Uh, it was after I read a book called Good to Great by Jim Collins that talks about uh, uh, companies having a core purpose uh, which should be something that you almost can't realize. And, uh, uh, but it's what keeps you sort of going forever and ever. And there are examples of, uh, at some point, Microsoft had the core purpose of putting a PC on every desk. They actually achieved that. And now what do they do? Uh, it, uh, I ha haven't heard like a, a, a very pointed description of it, whereas the other one was that. Um, and what does this really mean? I mean, this is uh, a pretty outer thing. How can a computer game really be more meaningful than real life? And uh, I mean, a game is just a logical construct, but uh, what we have learned through the process of living with Eve Online uh, is that uh, Eve Online ultimately is about emotions. Uh, and it's about emotions uh, that come together through an operating system and they channel and affect each other. And, uh, and that is a bit of a, a leap to to, to sort of accept that. And to explain it a bit, I'm gonna tell you a story. Uh, it's a story about me. Uh, this is me uh, 11 years ago. Um, I had my daughter, Eva, who's named after you online, uh, <laughs> born in September. And I was kind of burnt out by the craziness of making you online. Uh, and I was on paternity leave. And um, those of you who have had a baby, I mean, when, you, when you're there on paternity leave, it's mostly about being there. You actually don't do much, okay? Baby's asleep, it's awake. To the mother, okay, <laughs> fat, change the diapers, okay. I'm here, ready for anything, but it's my purpose, really. <laughs> okay, I have a lot of free time. I'll better go and, and play computer games. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I go and, and try to play EM Online. And it was very interesting like Eve Online was less than perfect when it came out. Uh, so it was like playing the game was like watching somebody doing a card trick, you just taught them and they're doing it wrong. It was just like, oh, we haven't fixed this already. Oh, it's like that. And I start writing like a QA list <laughs> and sent to <laughs> the people that were working at CCP. And it's like, okay, now I'm really working. Uh, I'm not really playing, so go and play some other games. And, <sighs> and I go back into Eve. And I, and I decide, okay, I'm just going to find a way to join a player corporation. That's obviously the way the, the, the game is meant to be played. And I'm just going to find ways to not make anyone know that I'm the CTO of the company, which I was at the time. Uh, so I join, um, and uh, I join a, a, actually a British uh, corporation that was a small group of, of, of guys, actually led by a guy who... Uh, actually had the big problem, his grandson was always yanking out the internet court. Um, but uh, I quickly learned uh, that they were on a mission to get everyone in the corporation into a partnership. Uh, and they had figured out, uh, something that many EVE players at the time had figured out, that the way we had decided that uh, content progression in the game were supposed to work, which was meticulously designed as, here's a space station, here's an asteroid field, here's a cargo hold of a spaceship, it can carry this much by going back and forth to the minerals, harvest the minerals, goes to the station, reprocess them, and build another spaceship that's bigger. But they had figured out there was a way to actually go to the asteroid field, eject a cargo container, and then mine into the cargo container, and I have a large hauling ship to bring back the minerals. And I was like, oh my god. Quickly, the Excel sheets, we had meticulously calculated about content progressions, scaled through my head, and it's like, we must fix this. Like, they would ruin the game. Everyone will be on a battleship in three weeks instead of three years. 
oh my God, what should we do? Start the email, nerf the uh, mining into a cargo hold uh, <laughs> defect. But then I noticed uh, this actually was a very interesting gameplay. It was gameplay mostly about trust, because you had to trust that everyone was doing their job. You had to trust that the guy who was doing the hauling wouldn't steal the minerals. And because it was an open cargo container, anyone could come and steal the ore, so you had to protect the mining operation. Like, whoa, this is a much better email line than we designed. <laughs> so uh, how about we just roll with it? And I'm there just mining with them, and it's like having a lot of fun mining, um, which is not terribly entertaining in and of itself, but it's an interesting side effect. It makes it very social. People are talking about their lives and asking me questions like, oh, where do you live? Yeah, I live in Iceland. Do you know the CCP guys? Yeah, I know them. It's a small country. What do you do? I sort of work in IT. Uh, and, and sort of find ways to uh, not break cover without lying. So at some point in time, I, we were all there and we were having a lot of fun. And I had my little frigate. I wasn't contributing a lot, but I was there. Uh, and one guy is logging off, and he has a cruiser. And a cruiser is a much bigger, more powerful mining instrument. So I say, tell to him very smartly. So, if I borrow your cruiser, I can mine in the operation, contribute to the group faster, and we all are better off. He said, okay, that sounds logical. Uh, you just need to follow me around. I need to drop off some stuff, like way out somewhere in a different solar system in Eve. I go and follow the person to that station. We exchange spaceships. I'm now in a cruiser, and like, set an autopilot, bap, bap. And then I go to the toilet. I come back from the toilet, and I look at the screen, and I see the pot. And the pot is what happens when you lose your spaceship, then the pot comes out of it. And I had like seen the pot before, I was working on the 3D engine, I've been used it as a, as a test asset, sort of, the blinking lights, and it was kind of cool. But like now the pot was the real pot, and I think, oh my god, I didn't check the autopilot pot, I'm an idiot, I just like, did the most stupid error in the game I made myself, or at least participated in making. <laughs> and I'm like, what should I do? I mean, I disappointed my friend who just trusted me with my spaceship, and it's a spaceship, and it's, wait a minute, I could just make another one. <laughs> uh, I, I can just go to this console over here and make a spaceship. And then it's like, oh my god. No, I'm like disappointed in myself. And I'm, I'm thinking about cheating in my own co computer game. Like, we were meant to build a virtual universe. And if I, if I make a spaceship out of nothing, where no effort was put into it, then the whole thing is broken. Like, then reality just shatters. And I'm like, and I'm there, and I'm, I'm feeling all these emotions I've never felt. I mean, I never disappointed a friend this much looking at this gigantic screen there, this is before flat screens, and I just want to pick it up and like throw it out the window, and it's like, stand there sweating, and it's like, why is the game doing this to me? <laughs> <laughs> and I realized this was like a test from the universe, the EVE yeah. universe, will I uphold the rule? And I, and I just figured out there, okay, if I cheat and make a spaceship, that lie is going to infect the whole system, whether anyone knows it or not. It will be a a scar, it will be a broken promise uh, that will never be mended. So I then decide, okay, I will now have to go and mine for that spaceship every waking hour, give it back to my friend, then uh, use the spaceship I get to get to honor the contract with the, with the group I was in to make up all this. So I start on a mission on mining on my paternity leave, which I'm doing there. As you saw, I found a way to combine the two things of <laughs> being there forever and, and Gudrun and and, and, and uphold the law of the universe. Um, and this was, to me, like a, when I found out that, okay, if there is true investment and emotion behind all the items in the game, then, in a way, it's real. So what's the difference between a spaceship in Evil Line and a car in reality? One is made of electrons, one is made of atoms. But if there, if there is somebody that gone through the effort of designing and creating them, they are, in a way, the same. Because they represent that work and that investment. So when we go back to 2011, when I was speaking here 
uh, at Game Horizon following the very uh, <laughs> rocky release of Monocles into EVE Online for $60. It wasn't really the, the virtual goods, it wasn't really that that bothered people. It was in a way that we broke, in a, in a way, the underlying principle of the universe. As soon as you can interject something in there that isn't made of something, then it doesn't add up. And ultimately, it was also about that uh, we wanted to release uh, characters into EVE, and we just released the character creator, uh, which was actually very much embraced. And we had wanted to release a social feature, and we ended up releasing a little room and calling it that. So we were disappointing the community on, on many dimensions, making them riot, just like uh, they would when governments in reality disappoint their citizens. So uh, I encourage you to go back to YouTube and watch it. Uh, this is the fat version of me. I've lost weight since. This is a very slimming thing, running a virtual universe. <laughs> so this tiring business. Uh, and, it, and in any case, we embraced this. We changed course. Uh, we found ways to make this work uh, in a much more reasonable manner. We actually uh, have a system also, a system also in EVE called Plex, which I know many game developers have taken inspiration from, which actually is able to marry this equation of I invest time, I invest money, and you're able to arbitrate between the fact and customize your experience. And of course, that Plex system has provided a basis where now we know if you lose a spaceship in EVE Online, what's the cost of it? So when you see a headline like this, $300,000 worth of internet spaceships were lost in January in a massive battle that lasted 24 hours. You can watch it on Twitch. It's actually quite inspirational to watch. It's like a gigantic space opera, ballet, something. It's, uh, it's uh, quite epic. And that's on the basis that we have this Plex system that sort of defines the value of merit in the world. And every time this, this happens, we, of course, get a, a spike. This is the... We got 15,000 people to join even a day when the news broke that there was this massive uh, battle going on. And now if you go into that system, uh, we uh, can see like there is a monument there. There's a wreckage of all the titans that got lost. So you can look, the, look at the ruins of $300,000 worth of spaceships. And this is, of course, something that happens just in EVE on itself. We've built the basic principle of the game. So just like I was mining for a small little fleet back in 2003, now when they destroy $300,000 worth of spaceships, they are participating in some epic meta game. Actually, ultimately, it was because somebody forgot to pay their bills that the war broke out. But this is a, a, a big sort of territorial conquest of the universe of EVE, uh, where people want to like acquire resources to further build their one domination plan that usually crumbles because trust is broken and they get infected from the inside and social cohesion breaks. And this is what, uh, when I say Eve is real, which I said at the Eve FanFest in 2010 for the first time, then I have 2,000 people in the audience that nod and they say, yeah, it's totally real. And I've been thinking a lot about why is that? What is it that makes half a million people accept spaceships as valuable as their car. And there's something in the, in the reel you saw before about death is a serious matter, which means when I lost the cruiser, it was a serious matter. And that does an interesting thing where we actually plug into the muscle of hierarchy of needs. As soon as you're able to touch into the physiological state where I accept a spaceship is a real thing, and then food and shelter in that abstract reality start to mean something to me. And then you can sort of slowly go up the chain, and we have seen amazing feats of, of, of sort of real humanism occur in EVE based on the fact that uh, you can go into self-actualization uh, by participating in this virtual universe. But of course, it has a bit of a downside, which is uh, EVE uh, is a bit notorious for not being the easiest game in the world. We see here the plot of the various learning curves for uh, sort of popular uh, online games. And, uh, and we've often thought about like, what is it that makes Eve so hard? Um, and uh, it's an aspect of Eve where, okay, Eve is a little too complicated. And uh, we keep working on that to sort of streamline and simplify the game without making it any easier to play. We want the game to be hard. But it is this notion of accepting the reality of the spaceship which is hard. There's only a certain 
type of a person that can go into such an abstract space to have your logic touch your emotion. And I think uh, it's mainly the audience we have here, with us gamers, we, we, we know how it feels to, to get all, all emotional about a game. And to sort of address that, we have been working on a strategy uh, which we've kind of set uh, EVE everywhere, where we will bring a custom tailored EVE experience uh, to other devices than, than PCs. And of course, we've done this quite accurately with Dust, where you can shoot a laser from EVE Online and it lands on the ground in a PlayStation 3 game and, uh, and kills people over there. And we have had some success with this. We have had close to 900,000 people sort of participate in multi-dimensional warfare in the EVE universe. But uh, as we were talking about uh, last week, just actually on Saturday, we were announcing that now we're in the process of streamlining the EVE universe experience down to a PC. So now you can be a, 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 a sort of a, and just to sort of put the contrast, so instead of like spreading the experience out, we're now more looking into sort of providing custom tailored experiences that then sort of you can have based on sort of how long you want to play and what type of game you want to play. So you can go into Project Legion if you want to be a mercenary on the ground. You can go into Valkyrie if you want to have a full immersion dogfighting. And you can go into sort of Human Line if you want a large, epic battleships, titans, the size of cities. And, uh, and we're sort of experimenting now under this sort of new, more focused strategy to allow you even to sort of you can jump into the different games uh, with, uh, with different characters, or even <clears throat> like as we're sort of developing the storyline, is that you can sort of project your consciousness into different clones. And we're hoping this will uh, help people, more people over the gap. But there is actually another thing happening in the world which we're hugely excited about, because that almost just takes the gap away. If you have tried any of the awesome uh, virtual reality headsets that are now available, then you get this immense sense of presence and everything like, becomes way more sort of close to being an emotional experience. And we can see that uh, it works for everyone. We just put little kids into Valkyrie and, and they have an amazing time. Just love this picture. And it's so intuitive. Nobody has to be sold on my spaceship is real. They just feel it. I'm there. And it hurts when it's hit by a missile. And it's like when it explodes, it's like, oh, it's a, it's a, a much closer experience. And we're hoping with that, then we have, will allow a larger uh, part of the mankind, frankly, to jump into the thought space with us, where they accept this virtual reality to be uh, as meaningful, at least, as the real reality. And we have seen once what happens to people once they do that. Uh, we're very much sort of following. Some people have had very transformative experiences in EVE Online. Uh, there was a really good article in Financial Times in 2007 about people that have been CEOs in corporations in EVE and have later on founded their own companies and, and have, have learned a lot about leadership through EVE and had sort of the courage to go and found a real company after having experimented in virtual reality and had success with it. Uh, here's the most famous person in EVE Online. He is more famous person than me. I'm more sort of the janitor of the universe. This is the guy who rules the universe. Uh, when we have the fan event, he has more press interviews than I. Um, he's called the Mitani. He would love me to say that. So uh, here's another guy who spent a year infiltrating a space corporation to ruin it under contract. Uh, a great article was written about that uh, in PC Gamer. Uh, Murder Incorporate, Incorporated. Guiding Hand Social Club is a secret organization in, in EVE that has various code words and offers their services to ruin companies from the inside. So, uh, and ultimately we, we look at uh, the, the EVE players that have gone to the far most top of the Master of Hierarchy of Needs, more like our co-creators. They are the heroes and the villains of the EVE universe, and there are thousands of them, and they do amazing things. Like this guy, uh, he had a character in EVE Online, uh, and he, became so inspired while he was in EVE, he wanted to change himself in reality to more much what he saw in the game. And he went through this transformation to look more like his avatar in the game. And, uh, and he continues to do that. And, and uh, it's amazingly inspiring. And of course, tattooing is a, it's a big deal. Uh, and we have been collecting these stories of EVE players uh, through a, a website called True Stories. 
And when we analyze the stories, they are all about these emotions that I talked about in the beginning. So by sort of creating uh, this relatively harsh reality that's driven by emotion, connecting people together, uh, and finding a ways to like, okay, he was hard and make it through uh, uh, virtual reality. We can connect the virtual reality and the virtual world together, together. And I've been thinking about like, what does that all mean if we really achieve that? So if we really make virtual reality or virtual worlds more meaningful than real life, then we've been given one earth and currently we're ruining it because we consume. Our Maslow hierarchy of needs has turned into us into a consumption monster. 90% of the stuff we buy each day is gone out of our houses uh, in six months. So we just buy stuff, we consume and consume. We need a new car, a new iPod, because this one is pink, and because I need to articulate my persona, I need to wear these T-shirts with something else, and like we consume and consume and we consume. And it's ultimately a system that makes nobody enjoying it, really, studies have shown, and it's ultimately a system from our governments to control us. And I say, if we manage to pull this off, we can choose a more virtual life that fulfills all the hierarchy of needs, and we will save the planet. <laughs> Thank you.